Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by ShareFile from Citrix. Secure file transfer built for business. Visit sharefile.com, click the microphone, and enter Twist for a free 30-day trial. And by Hiscox. Do you have the proper insurance for your startup? Get the right insurance right now with Hiscox. Tailored coverage starting at only $22.50 per month. Visit hiscox.com slash mallbiz to get a quote. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's This Week in Startups. It's our healthcare edition. We've got a new format for you today. Ted Maidenberg from the Social Capital Partnership, an amazing venture capital firm in Silicon Valley, is with us. And together, Ted and I will interview three emerging healthcare startups and hear how they plan to change the world and make all of us just a little bit healthier. Stick with us. It's going to be an amazing program. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, Sid. Money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups. Today is our healthcare edition. With me is Ted Maidenberg of the Social Capital Partnership. Ted, how you doing? I'm good, Jason. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Uh, are we okay with the video there, Brandis? Yeah, okay, good. There we go. We got video. We got Ted. And I see that you're in a basement <laughs> somewhere. Um, this is... Uh, yeah, we're in the tornado shelter here at the Social Capital Partnership. <laughs> And that tornado is technology flowing through uh, Silicon Valley. The Social Capital Partnership's been in existence for just under two years. Is that correct? Yeah, we um, closed our first fund, uh, had a first close in August of 2011, and uh, a final close in the beginning of 12. And then we actually closed our second fund in March of 2013, which I think we announced at the launch conference. Uh, you did announce at the launch festival. And... Um, the firm has done great. Actually, we're co-investors in a couple of companies, including um, Brilliant, which uh, originally was all Cozy. And Cozy, the um, yep. um, awesome uh, real estate. Uh, real estate, yeah. yeah. Software as a service for landlords, which I'm actually going to use for the launch co-working space. So uh, on today's program, we're going to go and talk to three um, emerging healthcare startups and hear what their mission is. And then Ted's going to try to ask questions that a venture capitalist would actually ask in a meeting. So for those of you who are aspiring entrepreneurs, you're going to hear the raw, you know, cutting, challenging questions that a venture capitalist would ask in a meeting, like what's your China strategy <laughs> and what do you do when Microsoft comes into your market? And Ted, we're going to just sh shove right. those two questions. What are the annoying <laughs> questions, Ted, what are the annoying questions that VCs ask that are totally irrelevant, do you think? Um... Well, what's your mobile strategy is definitely uh, a big one as you know it it really should just be the strategy uh these days i mean i think international is is uh is often an asked question that is uh, pretty irrelevant but the, you know, the most annoying questions are when uh the vc or vcs haven't actually done any prep work and you're basically having to explain the company from the very beginning and so uh, that's, that's what we try to avoid as much as possible. So when you come into a meeting, how much research have you done on a company typically? Well, I mean, we try to at least, you know, get uh, an idea of what the value proposition is, uh, the competitors, um, and, you know, what we think the long-term business model would be. Uh, in, in healthcare, uh, in healthcare IT especially, you know, a lot of the problems that companies are solving are ones that you've dealt with as a consumer. Uh, and so you obviously have a little bit more uh, perspective in that manner. But, you know, we try, try to do as much work as possible, and that's why um, also speaking with the folks who made the introduction is uh, super helpful as well. Great. Okay, so let's get right to it. Uh, Caitlin uh, Gleason is the co-founder and CEO of Eligible. Uh, Caitlin, what is the mission of Eligible? Welcome to the program as well. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, the mission of Eligible is to help developers uh, pass and receive financial transactions with health insurance companies. So we connect to hundreds of them, close to a thousand, and then we make it simple. We, you know, create one connection for the engineers to connect to. So, and um, so, h how does that uh, exactly become a business? Would you say? Sure. Yeah. So um, every year, trillions of transactions are processed. So we're talking about payments. I, I think a lot of people don't realize that um, a claim, that's what, is, that's what it's called in healthcare. After a doctor performs a procedure, he actually submits an invoice to the insurance company to be paid. And, you know, that's a claim. That's a payment. 
Um, before he does the procedure, he calls the insurance company to make sure the patient has coverage. That's an eligibility query. So all of these things are actual transactions that are costing the industry, you know, billions of dollars every year. Um, trillions of them are passed every year. And we're trying to help developers streamline that, obviously, through technology. So um, similar to Stripe for Healthcare, right? Instead of having to connect to some old gateway and pay some $5,000 setup fee and spend nine months implementing us, um, it takes about three hours and they can pass a claim to the insurance company, right? So Ted, you're actually an Got investor it. in this company. Um, is that right? Uh, no, no, we're not. Oh, you're no. not. Okay, so not if, you, if Caitlin comes into uh, a meeting with you, I'm not sure if she's met with you before, what's the no. first question you would ask Ted here? Yeah. Um, Hey, Caitlin. So hey. I, I think, you know, we've done a little bit of work in, in the space. We're investors in Simply, which is not, does not do what you do, but is about having more transparency and They're more better our, information flow. They're one of our customers. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think the question I would really have, and this maybe gets a little bit, you know, into the details, is I assume a lot of what you do right now at a large practice is handled by practice management software. Uh, we, our, like cu our customers are practice management software. So Cario.com. Okay, so all the. Yep, yep. so Cario has about 15,000 doctors and they build software for them and they're our customer. So we handle all the connections for them and they process eligibility through us. Got it, got it. And can you kind of describe what sort of information you're getting back from your query? Is it a yes, no? Or are you getting details on yeah. out-of-pocket maximums, deductibles? We are. We're getting details. Um, we're actually making Simply's life a lot easier because um, the way they used to aggregate that information and probably a reason why it was so hard and so co you know cost-consuming, right? It wasn't exactly something scalable. was because they were scraping the data from websites. So they were getting things like, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, out-of-pocket max or deductible, which is incredibly valuable information, but we're getting that information by pinging the insurance company. So we'll get, is the patient covered? We'll get all of their demographics that the patient has on, on file at the insurance company. We will get the copayment. We'll get the deductible out-of-pocket max. We'll also get cost containment. It's very detailed. It's a full plan, basically. It, it's the, the one complaint actually is that it's too much data, right? So we had to like, dice it up and and build libraries and build things that just made our our users life easier to deal with the data let me ask how long has the product uh, been in the marketplace and yes uh, yeah. so it's taken me two years to get it to, it's you know I started the company almost two years ago and um, it really just came out into the marketplace in December we launched in November but we really didn't see any sort of traction or growth until December and now we've just passed 1 million transactions and those are all eligibility transactions it's not claims it's not you know anything like that it's just eligibility and, and when you look started. at who's making those um, who, who's who's picking that the database is it mostly kind of uh, companies like the practice management who have already had existing relationships or is it new companies totally. looking to access this data? Good, great. Um, yeah, so we have two different types of customers and we're very aware of that. Our bread and butter right now is the old, you know, the older practice management systems. They've been in existence. They have thousands of doctors who use them. But then that's why we get so excited about people like Simply, right? Or, or someone like, you know, they're like, it's so exciting. They're using something for the consumer it's not your typical you know doctor's office software although that's really great for us you know so we we love Cario too you know so they're doing a, a really really disruptive thing in the practice management space but you don't see the real real old guys right Cario I would actually still consider like a startup like they're young and they're right. you know you don't see we're not gonna you know service someone who's been around for since 1996 when this all started right do you see a time when, say, a corporation like Google might um, use your API to create in their own private intranet their own solutions to uh, connecting with healthcare companies? So is this something that, you know, talking about Ted's new customers, new people to hit the API, not the practice management software, but are companies or individuals or is Nike Plus or, you know, somebody else going to start saying, hey, we can start interacting with your insurance company. So I, yeah. I, as a consumer, I could start pinging with somebody yeah. can make a third-party app just understand your insurance better 
Absolutely. And also just um, authenticate that this person has a, a plan, right? And just authenticate that this is the person's address. I mean, there are so many different ways to utilize it. Um, I have someone actually who's building on top of us that's um, working with, I, I think it, you know, it's one of these bigger companies, someone like Google, and they're helping them authenticate the patient's plan, right? So Google offers them insurance. Google wants to make sure that the patient is being preventative for, you know, at-risk pregnancy or something like that. Actually, one of my Rock Health um, teammates, uh, Wildflower Health, they were using it to authenticate to make sure that the Google plan is the one that they're actually signing up for when they sign up for their application. So there are definitely, we have a large amount of new companies testing and trying to figure out ways to use this information, but the bulk of the really high volume transactions, yes, to go back to your original question, Ted, is definitely yeah. the, the practice management, sure. Yeah, so you know, cost cost comparison and and transparency yeah. and pricing is a big issue. There's a great article in the New York Times on Sunday about the wide range of colonoscopy uh, prices across yeah, the United I, States. Yeah, but I have something. I mean, there's something that most people don't know because they don't know about the industry. So this, um, the, if you notice, the insurance company pays out the same amount. Did you notice if you look at the two, like even the Medicare, this big release of all the Medicare information, the data, yeah. if you look at the cost of what the hospital billed out, which is like 100K, and then let's say Medicare paid out 20K, that's consistent, what Medicare pays out. Right. But some, but because there's negotiated discounts. It's a, called a contractual obligation. Right, so right. it's, yeah, so like you build a contractual obligation with the insurance company to say, okay, I'm gonna be in network with you, right? So I'm a doctor and I'm right. gonna be in your network. And therefore the insurance company says, okay, I'm only gonna pay you $20 for this visit. And the doctor's gonna right. bill out 100, but the insurance company's only gonna pay 20. Right, right. Uh, I, I guess the, the question was around, uh, are you seeing folks use your API for uh, for cost comparison, or, or will you do that yourself? I think eventually, you know, I try and stay very focused on the problems that we can solve right now. And those are the, the sort of railroad, the gateway from, you know, all the insurance companies to the developers and building that railroad. I think eventually, inevitably, we're going to have all that data, right? So all that data will be yeah. ours because we're processing all those claims. Um, so certainly we're going to have it. So we can then, you know, build cost estimation tools, cost comparison tools at that point. Ted, and will then you open it up uh, as an API. Sorry. Ted, when you hear an enabling technology company like this, uh, something that's going to enable, you know, a lot of other people to more efficiently do something, is that something that as a venture capitalist you find is it an amazing opportunity or for something to be an amazing opportunity does it actually have to have direct access to customers is this something that this sort of yeah layer? i mean it's it's definitely yeah. it, it definitely was a point that on the big picture side that you would think about is just you know being behind the scenes uh versus directly talking um with uh with the end user uh but also having more of a you know control over how your data is actually being presented now sure. You know, early on, I think it makes a lot of sense to let a lot of people, you know, touch, use the data, see how it's being done successfully, and then bring, you know, more of that in-house. And I think another piece that would actually make me more positive uh, on the company is the difficulty of the of accessing and processing and normalizing the data that you are using. If this was that's exactly what we're you know, doing. If this now. was just like price comparison shopping became commoditized very quickly because it actually isn't that hard to build a crawler and to scrape right. plasma TV, you know, prices. But healthcare but data a is, direct is very different. Into CMS Medicare, so building a direct pipeline like we just finished last week into CMS Medicare, we own those pipes, right? Building a direct yeah. connection to Blue Shield of California, we own those pipes. So every transaction that goes through them we're going to get a percentage of those transactions. Okay. When we get back from commercial break, we're going to um, – thank you so much, by the way, uh, Caitlin. Great, great job. Sure. Uh, and good job, Ted, with your questions. When we get back, Jason Oberfest yeah. is going to talk to us a little bit about Mango Health, Health, an app that lets you take control of your health. Um, and let me just stop for a moment here and pause for the cause and thank Hiscox Small Business Insurance for making getting small business insurance delightful and easy, customized coverage, competitive pricing – on small business insurance, and it's designed for very small businesses as well. It could be like a self-employed consultant or a startup. 
completely tailored coverage. Customers save $500 a year on average versus other insurers. And it's all online. It's simple. It's easy to do. I, I mean, I, I'm reticent to say this, but it's fun to go get insurance. It's easy. You can just answer a couple of questions step by step, and all of a sudden they give you a price. And you say, hey, I want more coverage. I want this type of coverage. And you can watch your prices change. It's what buying insurance should be. It's what it should have always been. Nobody wants to deal with these, like, numbnut brokers calling you on the weekends and trying to high-pressure you into things, and you feel like you're being gamed. Just go to Hiscox, and um, you'll get everything solved just by filling out a form, which is how life should be. It's like the Uber of insurance, uh, of small business insurance. Go to HiscoxUSA.com slash smallbiz. H-I-S-C-O-X-U-S-A.com slash smallbiz. You know, examples are like a technology business that needs uh, $200,000 of software or copyright infringement. Um, that wouldn't be included for a marketing consultant. So if you're a marketing company versus a software company, they're going to just figure out what insurance you need and make you only pay for what you need. It's super easy. Plans start at just, you know, tens of dollars a month. You have no excuse not to use it. It works great. We use it ourselves here at Launch, and we're very proud to have them as a sponsor of the program for a number of years. Hiscox does a great job, and go ahead and tell them on their Twitter account that thank you for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups at Hiscox Small Biz, H-I-S-C-O-X Small Biz with a Z. They do a great job, and I really thank them for helping startups. HiscoxUSA.com slash small biz. Um, just awesome and easy to use. And we, you know, we have our choice of sponsors and advertisers for the program, and we've made the choice to only do products that we use ourselves. This way I can read the ad and endorse it and just not have you come up to me at an event and be like, hey, Jason, you told me to get these e-cigarettes and I used them and now I'm dying. <laughs> like literally an e-cigarette company is like, hey, Ted, this is a true story. E-cigarette company says, we'll give you 10 dimes in poker chips and we'll pay your World Series if you wear like e-cigarette things and you have an e-cigarette in your hand during the game. Should I take it or not for the main event? Ted, what do you think? I, I think you can do better than that, Jason. Exactly. That's why I settled on wild turkey is going to be my official. <laughs> Every level I take a shot of wild turkey, and boy, it's going to be a great main event. All right, let's go to our next company. We've got to keep the program moving here. Jason Oberfest, hey, I know you, is on the program hey, with Mango Jason. Health. How are you doing, pal? Very well, thanks. How are you? Great having you on the program. You're a serial entrepreneur, yeah? Uh, this is my first from scratch startup, but I've been involved in startups for a long time. That's true. Startups including? Uh, my previous company was NG Moco, the yep. game company. I ran the platform there. Yep. And uh, prior to that, I was at MySpace, which is, I think, where we first met sure. in L.A. And uh, prior to that, uh, I ran the strategy division of a product design consultancy called Blast Radius, which is now part of the WPP group in New York, back in the old days in New York. Yeah, Silicon Valley days. And NG Moco right. made, of course, that uh, Kingdom game. I forgot the name of it. Um, did we phenomenal. rule. I we think, rule. Yeah, did we phenomenally rule. well for a while. Yeah. And then... You got bought by Mixi or Gree? Was it a Japanese company who bought it? Uh, DNA. DNA. DNA, the Japanese company, correct. Wow, it went, took me three Japanese companies to get there. Okay, very good. All right, so let's hear about your business. What is the mission of Mango Health? So very simply, we're, we're using everything that we've learned over the years about game design and mobile app development to inspire people to get healthier. It's, it's really that simple. So very, very generally personal health management. And our first application is focused squarely on medication and supplement management and a very large and still relatively unknown issue uh, often referred to as medication uh, non-adherence or non-compliance. And, um, okay, Ted, when so uh, you can probably see it on your site there. I'm pulling up the screenshots myself. Um, yep. What do you, what was the first question you ask a company like this that's doing compliance uh, around medication. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I think this is, um, you know, letting letting users get control better of their their own health. Mobile. This, these are all themes that we spend a lot of time on. Uh, you know, one of the, you know, one of the big changes that's happening with healthcare. It actually has nothing. It's not really to do with Ob Obamacare, but more just with the rising premiums. Is that everybody whether it be large corporations or even small partnerships are, are just starting to pass on more of the costs of healthcare via the form of higher deductibles and basically more consumer directed healthcare payments. And I think that is what's finally going to make consumers really care and start to engage about uh, engage with their health. It used to be, you would say a, a sick person, you know, doesn't really, you know, doesn't really care. They're not going to get better. They're not going to eat less. They're not going to quit smoking because that's 
you know, if, if they were if they had that problem to begin with, there must be a, a character flaw uh, or, or some you know something inherently wrong. Uh, but when you start to put five thousand, ten thousand out of pocket maximums in front of somebody and they're not able to go on vacation because they went to the emergency room, I, I think it's really going to change the way that people start to uh, to think about their own health. So um, that's sort of a general uh, uh, prelude. Uh, I, I think you know the problem of uh, pharmaceutical medicine adherence is a huge one. Uh, I've seen numbers like 30 to 40 percent of prescriptions are filled in the United States. I know from my work on the board of uh, Asmapolis, which I think is coming up next, um, that they've seen even lower rates of that in some cases. And you know, these are for drugs that are diagnosed, prescribed by a physician, and they only work if you take them every day on a consistent basis. And so um, I, I think there are huge, huge changes that can be made to an individual's health and the overall cost of a healthcare system if simply you're, you're taking the drugs on schedule that your doctor has prescribed for you. So what would your question be? I mean, coming into a meeting like this, it <laughs> seems like you've drunk the Kool-Aid. You've got a lot of uh, background in this space. You understand it. What do you think yeah. would be your first question to a Mango Health? You know, it, it seems like you're you're, you know, kind of like yeah. I mean, I, I think it'd be it, it'd be really around distribution and engagement. Okay, so, so ask, one, that, ask that question to Jason. Jason, talk to me about distribution <laughs> and engagement. There you go. Yeah, so I, I agree. I think those are the two hardest issues in the space that we're working in. There's no doubt about it. Um, I, first, I would focus on the engagement question, um, you know, and really having spoken with so many different um, leaders in the health space who, who work in this general area of health and wellness initiatives, what I constantly hear from people over and over again is really two things. One is getting consumers or patients to adopt any of these programs is really difficult. And then for the small uh, minority of people who do adopt these programs, getting them to stay with the programs over time is really difficult as well. And so really that I think plays to our strength as a company. Our background is making mobile apps and other products that millions of people want to use for really long periods of time. That's really our focus. And so we're applying that here to this space. And so far we've seen really good results. We, um, before we launched publicly uh, in the App Store, that was uh, in early April, we had run a 16-week pilot. We really wanted to measure over a pretty long period of time. That's longer than I would normally run any sort of a beta or pilot, but we really wanted to see over that period of time what kind of effect we could bring. And we saw very strong uh, repeat usage. For us, the number one metric, similar to a game company or many consumer companies, is uh, what I think of as unaided return rate. So over a period of time, how many people continue to use the application or the product in an unaided way? And we've seen fantastic levels of engagement and you know, we're continuing to just leverage that and build on that as you know, we go to a wider audience and a public release. So that's on the, yeah. J that's J on J the engagement. Oh, Sorry, I, was, yeah, I was gonna quickly, I was gonna quickly try to you know, tease out a bit more about the comparison to um, you know, to the online and mobile gaming space where it, it seems to me like after an initial engagement period of a game, their retention is among these very power users, the whales who, who drive a lot of revenue, who have leveled up, who want to maintain, you know, their status. Um, how, yeah, how do you how, maintain how your you status think... in week 10 of taking, you know, whatever you're taking, Prozac? Yeah, so Jason, to answer your question, uh, the way um, the way it works, we're, we're using a, a number of things that we've learned over the years, but principally, um, we're using what many refer to as an earned currency system that you would see in many different types of social games. So very simply, over time in the app, as you stay on your prescribed regimens, you earn points. As you earn points, you level up. So there's a very clear sense of progression in the application. And as you level up, uh, you unlock the ability to win different items of value. So uh, cards from leading retailers, donations to leading charities and things of that nature. Um, so some of our consumers we're seeing are very interested more in just really the quantified self aspect of it, just this idea of tracking points and levels and things like that. Others are a little more interested in the potential to win items of value. But in either mm -hmm. case, there's that sense of tracking and progression, which is very similar to what you might see in, in a game. What do you think, Ted? And Jason? What are you What are you doing to What are you doing to encourage? I assume all the data is self-reported right now. Um, it is right now, but we can also verify that. Um, you know, very, very, 
very easily in a number of different ways. And I think that plays into how we see the non-inherent space in general. Many of the initiatives in this area that have been driven by the health industry are very focused on trying to improve rates of adherence by improving mechanisms for tracking. So there are lots of different startups out there right now that are really focused on improved tracking. And those are very Im important parts of the overall problem and, and fixing it. But what we really believe is the root cause of this issue is behavioral at the end of the day. The fact is that mm -hmm. the most common diseases in the United States now are diseases with very deferred consequences in many cases, if you think about it. The big three diseases, right. high, high blood pressure, high cholesterol and diabetes, typically when you're diagnosed with those diseases, it's a, it's a far ways out that you're actually gonna have a real challenge. So it's classic human nature. It reminds people of a part of their lives they're not happy with, they don't like doctors, for whatever the reason, they're just not inclined to get on track. And so we're really addressing that issue um, front and center. That's really our, our first initial Got goal. Got it, how, how, are you, how are you finding yourself engaging or your users engaging um, with, their, with their physicians? So it's interesting, you know, yeah. I, yeah. yeah, I mean, initially, you know, I wasn't sure how physicians um, would perceive the app and, and pharmacists and other healthcare professionals for that matter. We just weren't sure. And, you know, it's very early. I mean, we're two months in now to the app being live and, you know, openly available in the market. But so far, the feedback has been really good. I mean, I would say almost every day now we're getting emails from some combination of physicians and pharmacists saying, hey, thank you. For, for producing this, this is making my job easier. And we all know doctors are being asked to do a lot more with less these days. Pharmacists have a lot less time for, you know, for talking with patients. And really what we're trying to do is help people manage their care in between visits with these professionals and freeing up the dialogue with these professionals to be more strategic, high value you know, discussions. So they've been very welcoming of it, we've found at least so far. Got okay, um, and I guess the question I have is, um, is there something about gaming and giving these gift cards? I'm assuming the gift cards are given, to the funding of the gift cards is from the drug companies or the insurance company. Did you answer that, Jason? Um, well, actually, um, what we're finding is that there are many leading global brands outside of the pharma space directly mm -hmm. who are very interested in what we're doing. We essentially have an ability to connect leading global brands with health-oriented consumers who tend often to be some of the highest lifetime value consumers. Ah. So if you think a lot about how brands get integrated into games and the currency of games, we're actually doing something very similar. Oh, so in somebody who has context. like Rite Aid Pharmacy might want to give you a $3 gift card if you're taking your high blood pressure pills. Uh, yeah, but I, I think uh, other brands as well. I mean, even brands like um, Target, who we announced as a strategic partner of ours for launch, who happens to have a pharmacy business, but you have to talk to Target. My sense is they see it more generally than that. They just see it as a way to get health-oriented consumers into their stores, period. Mm. And we're seeing that with other charities as well um, and, and many other brands that we're working with. Awesome. All right. Well, let's keep the train moving here. Um, great job, uh, Jason, with Mango Health. And when we get back, we're going to have Mark from Asthma Pol Asthma, how do you pronounce that? Tech? Asmapolis. Asmapolis. Asmapo yes. Asmapolis. It sounds like Greek. A map. I mean, it is Greek. It's like a map. We put Asma on the map. All right. When we get back from this uh, commercial break, we'll have Asmapolis on. Um, which is helping, uh, obviously, in the asthma space. And let me just thank ShareFile by Citrix, uh, designed for business to share and send files of almost any size securely. And you can access those files, of course, from any computer or mobile device. Uh, we use it here at This Weekend and Launch. We request uh, files. As you can see here, we can easily uh, click and request a file from our sponsors. You know, when we have ads or assets and that kind of thing. We get email alerts when they do send us something. And uh, we share very large video clips. It's secure file transfer built for business. It works very well. Go ahead and visit sharefile.com. Click on the radio microphone button. See, it says radio listeners. Click here up on the top right. So go ahead and click that and then start your free trial. Um, no credit card required. And use the promo code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T, as of this week in startups. Um, and if you do, you'll be part of the Sharefile Twist fan club which gains access to our top 10 questions ever asked in 350 plus episodes of this week in startups so step one sign up for share file uh, use the promo code twist and step two you're going to request a file uh, link by emailing sharefile at launch.co and then we send you and share with you that file so go ahead and sign up 
click on the radio microphone button at sharefile.com. No credit card is required. It's a 30-day free trial. And request a file from sharefile at launch.co. Available only by requesting through sharefile. Not available on YouTube or any other content uh, service. Thank you so much to Sharefile by Citrix. You've been a great uh, partner from the program and a great product. Uh, everybody go ahead and thank at Sharefile on uh, their Twitter account. Well done, Sharefile. Uh, okay, so last and certainly not least, Mark from Asmopolis. What is the mission of Asmopolis? Did I pronounce it correct? Uh, it says Asmopolis, like as a map. Asmopolis, Asmopolis. Like Minneapolis. Asmopolis. Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Asmapolis. So what we do is we're a, an asthma and COPD disease management platform, uh, which means we provide tools that help patients, physicians, caregivers, parents uh, better manage asthma and keep people out of the ER, out of the hospital, uh, which is important to our customers who are payers, insurance companies, and at-risk providers, which are healthcare systems. And one of the key things we do is attach sensors to the medications to automatically track the time and location of those inhaler events, uh, which lets us know how the patients are doing and also gives us a window, a map of where asthma is occurring, uh, both for the individual, individual patient and in the community. Wow, that is completely mind blowing. So uh, <laughs> you're saying, because I have asthma uh, when I was a kid for a long time and uh, when I'm over a certain weight, it comes back. So I have actually some rescue inhalers, but this is a device that goes on a rescue inhaler. Uh, yeah, here, I'll hold one up. It's, there's the inhaler in blue and that's our sensor on the top. Now, and it transmits the data via Bluetooth through an iPhone or Android phone or a home base station. Okay, so you don't need to, in that device, have GPS or a cellular network. You're simply connecting over low wattage Bluetooth to my phone and keeping track of all that stuff. So you need compliance from the individual. They have to have their phone with them. and has to be connected. Uh, to get the event live, but it, it'll store the event and transmit it later if, if they don't have the phone live. So but then you wouldn't have the GPS, though. That's it, right. We'd that's lose location if there's too much delay. Um, so th this must have been an amazing thing when you guys came into the Social Capital Partnership. Ted, when you saw this device, did you just have the same experience? Because this is the first time I've seen it. Did you have the same experience I just had, which is OMG, like, why doesn't that exist already? Yeah, well, so it was, um, it, it was, it was introduced to us um, by a, a mutual colleague, uh, actually uh, one of the investors uh, in the company, and um, as a as one of their most exciting you know investments and in, and in a company that which they've been uh, working with for a while and you know when it came in I think it, it it really hit on a bunch of different you know themes for us you know as you've heard a bunch of times from uh from your old uh, from the guys who backed uh, uh, Mahalo at Sequoia they always talk about team and market right so yeah. I think what we saw here was huge markets um, asthma and COPD and a team uh, between uh, Mark and, and David Van Sickle who had both clinical expertise and, and also expertise in building um, IT and you know, technology companies, which is something we, re we really look for in these healthcare IT companies is someone who sat on both sides of the, uh, of the fence. And then you know the trends that they're playing on, whether it be mobile sensors, medical adherence and then also helping um uh helping doing population management for for high-risk individuals it, it was really a, a no-brainer for us to be honest and uh, i think it was one we were able to move, move you know fairly quickly on um the company had run very lean uh, had already received their fda approval for the device and was up and running in a few regions and i you know i think we hit it off and Despite the fact that they make me schlep to Madison, Wisconsin a couple of times a year, <laughs> uh, I love the company. Wow, Madison, Wisconsin. That's brutal for a venture capitalist. I mean, in a way, Ted, <laughs> in all honesty, when a VC has to get on a plane, that does raise the benchmark for the company, right? They have to be just that much better. Do you think, Ted? Um, I, I think... I, I don't think that you have to have a better quality of the actual actual overall opportunity because that would be saying that local deals you'd be you'd be willing to invest in a less interesting company. They they all have to be super interesting. For me, it's about the management team 
and do they have kind of a little bit more maturity? Have they been around the block a few times? Especially in a place like Madison, there's a lot less infrastructure for a, for a new startup founder, a young startup founder, um, to kind of build a, a company. And so the fact that, um, you know, Mark and David and his team uh, have a little bit more experience uh, was certainly played a role in our, in our decision. All right, so let's just do a couple questions here, Ted. Um, you, we had three amazing companies here. Obviously, you've invested in one, but let's just take the other two, Mango and Eligible. And if you w if you could only invest in one, which one is the most investment worthy at this time? I know it's a difficult question. I know they're on the line, but there is a lesson to be learned here for entrepreneurs listening of which idea do you think has the edge and why? So please be as authentic and honest as you can, Ted. Got it. Uh, you know, to be honest, uh, as you know, Jason, these are two completely different companies, and right. uh, very Disclaimer hard to taken. even you know yeah. compare them. Right. Disclaimer done. But you, you know, um, to me, at least in the stage where they're at right now, um, I think that it, it may be our point of view to have more of a wait and see attitude on on Mango, simply because they're they're direct to consumer. And it's uh, it's been quite uh, recent since they've launched. I I could dig into the numbers of the beta in the first two months, and actually that could change my mind. But uh, on a consumer you know facing uh, company, I think that it would be um, a little bit more difficult to to pull the trigger. I I also um, I also am concerned about the fact that the user has to enter in all of this data and just the, the authenticity and the quality of the adherence data. And I think that can change with some more data sets that they integrate. Uh, so I think that's another you know uh, concern I have with it. Um, and and as, as far as with, with Eligible, uh, you know, as you know, again, they're, they're a partner of one of our companies. Um, I, I do think this is very, very, valuable data and the arm supplier um, uh, business strategy is is very interesting um, you know my big concern there is just uh, there aren't a lot of billion dollar plus companies uh, that have been created off of kind of being the data uh, the, the data supplier I mean ITA is a good example that was providing data to Kayak and and Travelocity. I think that was sold for 700 million, and Kayak was sold for 2 billion, which kind of gives you an idea of a derivative of of, right. of data versus the consumer facing or business facing site. So essentially, but what you're I'm, saying, you know, Ted. we're so bullish yeah. on the fact that healthcare is going to change. I do think that, yeah. Well, I'm saying you're you're saying in one instance one is two consumers, so that has you. Right. I mean, this is the frustrating nature of venture capitalists. On uh, one phase, you're saying it's two consumer, and so that's concerning. You need to yeah, see yeah. more data Mind results. You. On the other side, you're saying, yeah. hey, you know, like these non-consumer arms dealer stuff, they never get too big. Uh, Mdion, look up Mdion. They sold for three billion, so okay. they're a healthcare arms, but they're uh, old. Yeah. They're older. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And they they do yeah. do some top stuff. But I mean, this is the nature of the venture capitalist and entrepreneur relationship, just for people who are tuning in and who maybe don't know as much as this is, you know, the VCs, they have to make, uh, you know, bets and they've got to reduce risk and, and have as big an outcome as possible. Those are their two variables, reducing risk and increasing the chance of a huge home run. Um, Jason, let me start with you. You heard the sort of the objection like, hey, yep. you know, we got to take a little wait and see. Consumers hard and there's compliance issues. What do you think you have to prove to get venture capital money to take the idea really seriously? I know you've raised some money, but where are you at mm -hmm. in funding? And, and you must have heard this objection before. How do you get over it? Yeah, I, it, it's a fair point. And what I would say uh, to Ted's point is, you know, imagine a scenario. I think we can address uh, the, the, one of the concerns he's raising pretty, pretty clearly. Imagine a scenario where we're integrating with it, it could be a payer, it could be a provider, it could be a PBM in any case. But from the user experience, the flow would be you install the app and all of your information is pre-filled. And when you go to refill, it's actually tied into those systems. So the, so the self-reporting nature of it goes away. And then at that point, 
we're essentially monetizing in three ways. Uh, initially, we're monetizing on things like refills. So our app knows, we know exactly the quantity you have on hand and we decrement down as, as you use the application over time, which puts us in a perfect position to do refills and lead generation around refills, both for prescription medications, OTC medications, and nutritional supplements, which are all in and of themselves really large businesses. So that's sort of one revenue, very short term, very immediate revenue stream that we've, we've seen play out right away. The second revenue stream is more outcomes. So what's really useful about us is that every one of the constituencies we talk to in the health industry has very specific unit economics for adherence. So I can sit down with them and show them the levels of engagement and adherence that we saw, for example, in our 16-week pilot. They can plug that into their models and tell me exactly what that's worth financially to them by type of user, by class of medication, or anything like that. So we have unit economics that we've already validated that work for the application that we're doing. The third piece, I would say, the third revenue stream, and this is leaving the brand revenue aside, but even just in the health industry, mm -hmm. the third revenue stream is around the value of the aggregate data. So if you think about it now, pharma manufacturers, I read one report, I think this is pretty widely accepted, spend more now on sales and marketing than they do on R&D, yet they have very, very limited access to consumer insight. The, the, retail, the pharma retailers don't give them back that data. You know, the health insurance companies don't give them back that data. We know everything that a user does, not only within their prescriptions, but across a much broader spectrum of over-the-counter medications and supplements. And that's priceless. We can answer questions like your See, medication the in the second class. I, th I think that's all great, Jason. I think the missed opportunity, I think, in what you're doing is – People take these medications to get a certain outcome, right? Like I take the, I, I take some hypertension drug to lower my blood pressure, um, but you're leaving out that sort of a lot of the value you discuss is the value for the pharmaceutical company. I think actually, if you could, if I put in my blood pressure or my heart rate, um, or you know how I'm feeling emotionally, if it was a you know a depression drug or something like that, and you could track the consumer, you know, quantitative quantified self data along with the medication and correlate them, then you're sort of getting even more value into it. Have you thought about that? Oh, you're so spot on. I couldn't agree more. We've actually designed, we have <laughs> working designs in a lot of those things that you're mentioning. Oh, um, sorry to I'm reveal just, the roadmap. It seems pretty obvious. No, it, it is. It's a great point. And I, I don't know about you guys, but just having done consumer products for so long, I'm just a really big fan of having a razor sharp value proposition. And very simply, when we started looking at this market really carefully, doing the ethnographic research that we always do when we start building a new product, what we saw right away was just the fact that for many people, four out of five people now in the United States take some combination of these things every week, prescription drugs, OTC drugs, and supplements. Hardly anyone takes them correctly. And for that mainstream user, step one towards better health starts there. So we wanted a product with a razor sharp consumer value proposition. And then from there, we build into some of the broader areas that you're describing. Hey, Ted, if he had presented it as compliance for the hypertension drug and self-reporting and, and quantified self, and because you have a device on that asthma you know, uh, startup is pretty powerful to you guys, would you have thought of it differently? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, Jason, this, this goes back to the, the point about having the right team. I mean, I, you know, from a short uh, presentation like this, and I've, I've known, I've seen uh, Mango uh, before and some other iterations, you know, it's, um, it's, it's hard. You have to make a bet that the entrepreneur, the founder is going to see around the corner and, you know, make the right choices on the product and, and on the business side. So uh, again, I was, you know, giving my objections to what was given on the, you know, what we talked about earlier today. But I think the bet you have to make here on a recently launched, you know, consumer facing uh, product is really much more on the roadmap and, you know, linking yourself with this company as the Series A, Series B investor and being along for the ride. All right. Um is it, it's, it's a lot less. It's a lot less about what is actually in the market right now. If you, there's very few investments we make where it's based on what they've done in the past. It's much more about what they'll do in the future. Caitlin uh, Gleason of um, Eligible, the API that connects uh, software developers with um, healthcare information. You heard some of the feedback. This is an objection you must get all the time. Ha have you thought about, like, hey, can we dip into the consumer side a little bit, or are you c trying to constrain yourself so that you're not in competition with 
your customers. Exactly. I will never do it. Yeah, we will stay at the bottom and we will be a billion dollar company. Um, I think it's really something that happens in healthcare all the time, and I think this is why problems don't get fixed, is that everyone starts to crawl up the stack. Everybody starts to build on top because it's easier, it's faster. I mean, what we do is hard work. <laughs> like, it's, it's, a, it's gruesome. There's no getting around it. There's no easy fixes. There's no pretty design to make it better, right? You have to build the pipelines. Um, and I really do think that there's enough data in healthcare that needs to be passed. I would see, instead of going to consumer, we would go to clinical information. Right now, we, we handle financial information right now. We handle financial transactions. We would move toward clinical data. It, the reason we don't do that right now is because the question is who's gonna pay for that? We mm. know who pays for the financial data. But never, no, we'll never, never compete many, with our users. <laughs> how many of the major providers do you have in the system currently? And what's, what's yeah. your sort of coverage like? Who are you missing? We, can, yeah. we connect to over, it's about a thousand now, but I would say only 200 of those are direct connections. Mm -hmm. But we chose, that handles over 80% of the insured population are direct connections. Right. Um, and then with everyone, you know, it has just about everybody. But you need to get, ultimately, nine. the goal is to have direct connections with every provider. Everyone. Every health information source. Yes. A and are they um, resisting giving you access, or is it just a matter of your funding and your bandwidth and your, you know, time to get everybody 100% it, It's a matter online? that I... I, sorry, I, I tend, sorry, cut you off, but it's yeah. a matter of me knowing the rules. So mm -hmm. the Affordable Care Act actually, in a lot of ways, is forcing the insurance companies to be real time, to allow outside connections, to to normalize some of their connections, because they used to be like dial up and like VPNs, and I mean we're yeah. normalizing all that. So it's just knowing that, and I can actually bring that up to the insurance company. There are a bunch of them that we were their first real time connection, HTTPS SOAP. So. All right, listen, let me ask everybody, I'm going to yeah. open, open this up to all four people on the panel. Um, on my screen, South Portland doctor stops accepting insurance post prices online. This is becoming a reoccurring trend. People are opting out of the insurance system and just saying, hey, here's the menu of prices. An office visit, one straightforward, cold, sinus infection, bladder infection, 50 bucks. Uh, you know, an extended one is 100 bucks. Complete physical is 150 bucks. House call, 200. I'll take that. I mean, <laughs> uh, Pretty amazing when you when you think of it. Um, let me let me put this out to Mark since we haven't heard from him in a bit. What do you think about sort of people just opting out of the insurance system and and the overall healthcare space? Uh, well, you know, for our product, there is down the road some kind of direct to consumer model where we would go to say through a retail pharmacy chain or a pharmaceutical company. Jason made a good point about their desire to connect to patients. Uh, but, you know, right now we're focused on the people who have big economic incentives, the insurance companies and healthcare providers, and we're reaching our patients uh, through those channels, which is interesting. We need to engage with those patients, uh, but they're not paying us. They're not our direct um, paying customer, but we do need to engage with them and, and uh, make them healthier. Uh, but, you know, from our, in our current business model, we don't see down the road perhaps of today we wouldn't be trying to reach a, you know, an a la carte uh, consumer. Ted, do you think that this is going to be a trend of people, I mean, there's already a large number of people going to walk-in clinics. In fact, there's, I think, a venture-backed walk-in clinic chain that's, you know, or trying to make affordable walk-in clinics that's yeah, venture-backed. One, well, well one, one, medical, one medical group is venture-backed, but, but that's, that does take insurance. It's more of a concierge layer on top of your, uh, on top of your existing coverage. I, I, I think this is going to become a much bigger trend. You see people moving to high deductible plans, which are basically catastrophic you know, insurance, and then jamming a bunch of money into a health savings account. And as long as these physicians who are advertising online or who, who want to do fee for service, um, you know, they're eligible to, to take HSA, FSA dollars, uh, you 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 will very well see a lot more of this happening as the con the consumer sees what it takes see what sees what it costs to go to a hospital or a clinic um, with the copay with their out of pocket and compares that to just using pre tax dollars um, I think you're going to see a lot more of the consumer taking control. Jason Oberfest of Mango Health. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Do you, do you think you're going to get to the point where consumers are opting out more and more? Um, I mean, in your case, 
they kind of need a doctor in order to get the prescription. So, but paying for it themselves seems to be more and more viable. And ordering drugs online seems to be cheaper and cheaper. Uh, you know, is are, are people going to route around the system? Yeah, I think I, I I don't know about opting out specifically, but I think in general the market becoming more transparent is, of course, just a great thing. I mean, it's it's. As I'm sure, certainly everyone who's participating here knows, I mean, we spend more than every other OECD country combined on healthcare in this country, and yet we rank basically last or close to last in almost every major leading health indicator. It's clearly a broken system. It's clearly a system, I think, where market forces will really help it. And I'm, I'm excited about that trend personally, as a consumer, as much as as an entrepreneur in the space. And let's um, end on this, um, uh, Caitlin. Obamacare, obviously very controversial. Um, people are starting to actually think that it's working. What is your personal take on it? Is Obamacare, what's the good of Oga Obamacare? What's the bad part? And where does that put you as an entrepreneur? What part of it? That's so big. Yeah. Do you know? It's so big. I mean, the part that um, is there's a very small section that no one knows about that put more constraints on the insurance companies to create more of a regulatory system closer to like financial um, banks where they have to process transactions in real time and and people don't realize it but that will really help um costs come down right will really help why would that help down. why would real because time it's not help paper. because it's not paper anymore uh. it's not going into a batch adjudication where some person is reviewing it it's a computer now Right. So yeah. all these things are still done by people. And it took Obamacare telephone. and to to force them to be more efficient. It's, I mean, that piece it started of it. with uh, it started in 1996 with I think it was Hillary Clinton, actually. Yeah. And then um, this this last in the Affordable Care Act, there's an article that put real pressure on it. Like, listen, you have to start following this. Right. Yeah. There it's like a dollar fine per covered life if they don't. Hmm. So there's yeah, there's definitely pressure there. Ted, what do you think? Um, I mean, obviously, you've seen the impact of Obamacare I and mean, some opportunities and some problems. What do you think? I mean, I, I think I, I think there's a lot um, there's a lot of regulation that's going to they're going to come down. One thing you'll see is more of these accountable care organizations being formed, which is going to help. I actually think push technology into the smaller clinics who have been able to buy technology like a large hospital like a large ACO so that's gonna I think be a big difference but I think you know more than anything it's just you know Obama hey we, we lost Ted here, there so here, let's um here, hey here. Brandis when, when somebody starts breaking up like that just have them switch to audio only and just walk them through that on the side so we can keep the show going Hey, uh, uh, let me just end with then, Mark. Um, which, Mark, what are your thoughts on it? How, uh, how well, for one business? thing, it's, yeah, for one thing, I think that was coming in, a, you know, the days of a, a health system doing better if an asthma patient comes into the hospital were numbered already, right? You've got integrated systems like Kaiser or Dean Health here in Madison that will be able to outcompete other health systems that are um, on that old fee per use model. So the, Accountable care accelerates that. that. From our standpoint, it's great. Those, you know, we can help um, healthcare systems meet those different metrics and objectives. Uh, but I think that was coming because of market forces, uh, to some extent, anyway. All right, uh, this has been an amazing episode. Uh, thank you to all of my guests, uh, Caitlin Gleason of uh, Eligible, which is eligibleapi.com, and you can follow her on Twitter, Cat Gleason with a K, K-A-T. Gleason, G-L-E-A-S-O-N. Uh, Caitlin, thanks for being on the program. Continued success to you. Uh, Jason Oberfest is uh, Jobberfest, <laughs> good one, on Twitter, J-O-B-E-R-F-E-S-T. And uh, MangoHealth.com is the uh, website. Uh, Jason, con congratulations on the early success, and um, stay in touch. Thanks, Jason. Mark uh, Gearing, of course, of uh, Asmapolis. Did I get it right? That's right. Very I good. got it right. Woo <laughs> Dyslexia work. I mean, it's just a, it's a terrible name, I think, as Maples. I mean, can we change the name? Are you stuck to this name? You know, we like the, we like the name now. It gets every conversation off to a good start when the person <laughs> mispronounces it. So I mean, we, we I like, like it. the polis We're because I'm a Calcanis. I like it's Greek. <laughs> it's good. As Maples. As Maples. It sounds like I feel like I'm wearing a Saganaki. I'll take a Saganaki with the side of Asmapolis. <laughs> 
if you can have some cafetes with that, it'll be delicious. Fantastic. All right, listen, Mark, continued success. I think what you're doing is brilliant. And um, thank you for dragging Ted's sorry ass out to uh, Wisconsin. Hey, listen, good cheese out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's it like? I mean, you built such an innovative thing out in the middle of the country. Do you feel like there's a stigma against like the middle of the country, and you feel like you're a second-class citizen compared to the valley? Uh, you know, I think there are big pros and cons, right? We don't. It's harder for us to hire an engineer or you know certain positions, uh, but I think there's a much different attitude here. We, there is a, a thriving tech community, and I think people are, you know, they, they know they're really loyal to the company. There's not a bunch of other startups to jump to. There's not big companies trying to recruit everybody. Uh, so, you know, pros and cons. We're very happy being here. Yeah, see, I think that's a very good point. You know, you, you can run a company anywhere. Great companies can emerge anywhere. They typically do emerge in one of the big metropolises, but it can happen anywhere. And you have an incredible advantage of lifestyle, and you're the best game in town. So, yep, that's makes right. sense. Uh, and uh, Ted Maidenberg, uh, thanks for being on the program. I don't know if Ted's still there. Ted, you there? Okay, so Ted, uh, we, we dropped off there. Sorry about that. We had a little Wi-Fi problem. Um, this has been an amazing program. Thank you to all my guests. Thank you to Brandis on the ones and the twos. Karen, I'm setting everything up. Hiscox Small Business, thank you for making getting small business insurance so easy. Your product is so buttery and smooth and delicious. And thanks to my friends at Sharefile by Citrix, uh, designed for business. Really great to use, and uh, we've had a great time with Sharefile.com. Click on the radio microphone button. Use the promo code TWIST and uh, you get your 30-day free trial, plus uh, you'll get that uh, Top 10 Questions episode. We'll see you all. Oh, yeah, and follow us uh, at TWI Startups. TWI Startups. Thank you, and we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. <laughs>